That's so solar. I guess Sarah doesn't. I mean, there is, I, I can talk about the solar heating of the pool at my house. <laughs> it's not something I installed, but <laughs> it, it is a thing. So we can Fair talk enough. about that. Okay. Yeah. And I am not a homeowner, so I do not have solar. <clears throat> Neither am I. Oh, uh, I guess you don't. Right. Yeah, I did. I didn't realize. Very yeah. much not a homeowner over here. I'll make it up for both of you guys. Wouldn't that be nice? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. Roger, let me know when we're ready. Uh, we're ready uh, in um, three. Do you want me to play music? Actually, yeah, that would be good. All right. Here we go in three, two. Welcome to our special DTNS solar panel round table show in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. In 2019, people installed solar panels on around 2 million U.S. households. That number just keeps going up. It's expected to triple by the year 2030. It might not be right for every household, but maybe it's right for yours. Are you sure? Do you know how to figure it out? What can solar do? What can it not do? If you're in Ohio, should you just give up because you got clouds half the year? Well, we're going to answer our, these and more questions. We put together a panel of solar panel owners uh, and experts to share their experiences so listeners can make a more informed choice about going solar. Uh, I have solar panels uh, that I put on my own house. Uh, Sarah, you you don't, but you have solar heating on your pool, so you're in the solar game a little bit. Indeed, yeah. There, there are solar panels on the roof of the Airbnb house that I manage, which uh, makes the pool quite warm. All so, right. yeah. Also joining us, uh, engineer at AES, kind of kind of bringing in the commercial perspective here. Joe Briney, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Good, Joe. Th thank you for being here. Uh, Steve Sheridan, brand new solar installer on your house and uh, producer of Nosilicast. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And uh, th this man is a, a 777 captain, airline pilot. Uh, I like to uh, describe him as a solar enthusiast. Brian Hoffman, welcome. Thank you, Tom. How are you doing? Good to have you, man. Thank you. Uh, let's go around the horn and uh, uh, talk about why you're interested in solar, why why you went with solar panels, if you put them on your house, uh, or Joe's case, uh, why you got interested in solar energy in the first place. Let's start with you, Joe. Uh, yeah. So when I was in college, I actually went to a school that uh, fed into a lot of aerospace companies. Uh, so I went to Loyola Marymount, which is down in El Segundo. So we were down the street from you know Boeing, Raytheon. Northrop, all those company, uh, all mm -hmm. those large companies, and uh, I participated in a federal program uh, where we did energy audits for medium scale manufacturers in the Los Angeles area. So we would go there, um, you know, do an energy assessment, give them, you know, ways they could save power, uh, you know, on their energy bills, and also with the climate change uh, perspective in mind. And um, it just turned out that um, it is very hard to get a lot of these businesses to invest a lot of money and uh, to, to change a lot of minds, to, to get them to change their habits. Um, and so I quickly realized that if we were going to, you know, do something about this climate change issue, that we really needed to go to the source of our energy. And so um, a couple of years after I graduated college, I took some courses, got certified as a solar energy professional, and I've been in the industry for about, let's see, 12 years now. And and just for anybody who's like, well, I'd like to get certified, what did that entail? So there are online courses that you can take. Um, the course that I took was actually at, uh, it was at Hawaii Pacific University. It was a 200 level course that they allow pretty much everybody to uh, enroll into. And then you take a, a test at the end of the semester or at the end of the course. Um, uh, it, <clears throat> it's really not that tough. Uh, the math isn't that hard. You just have to... Um, you know, understand a lot of the concepts behind, you know, how the panels are strung together, things like that. So um, you know, the entry to getting in is actually not too high. Nice. Well, and once you get that certification, d does it open up a lot of, uh, you know, opportunities for work that you wouldn't be able to have otherwise that other people are looking for that certification for? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it just shows a basic understanding of the systems. And so you don't even have to be, uh, you know, an engineer uh, to, to do this. So a lot of people in my class uh, that were also, you know, 
older than the the normal undergrads who were in there, you know, they were going for maybe sales positions or or maybe um, other sort of development uh, positions mm -hmm. within solar power companies. So, you know, if you wanted to get into this industry, it's not necessarily just about, you know, design and installation and production modeling. There's a lot more that goes into it. There's a lot of permitting. There's a lot of sales. Um, there's a lot of different avenues that you can take. Hmm. All right, Steve, uh, what about you? What what led you to go uh, get people to climb up on your roof and put solar panels up there? <laughs> well, uh, my wife and I recently purchased an uh, electric vehicle, each one of us. And on top of that, we were thinking of getting a new HVAC system installed in our home, but based on a heat pump. So that mm -hmm. that uses electricity for both electric or both uh, air conditioning and heating. So our electrical demands are going up and we wanted a way to offset that. Also, we wanted to reduce our carbon footprint. And, um, and it's just kind of neat to think of driving around um, and heating and cooling your home based on solar energy, based on the sun. So that yeah. was our motivation. So it, it's not exactly self-reliance the way California does it because you have to send your electricity into the grid and then they send it back to you, basically. But it's Correct. kind of a self-reliance sort of situation. Yes, yeah. Uh, Brian, what about you? You're, you're doing all kinds of fun things with solar energy over there. What got you interested in this? Well, when we started building our farm, we had a lot of projects that needed to get done around the farm. And I didn't really want to buy seven generators. So I kind of <laughs> figured out how I could use solar to do a lot of little projects. And the first big successful one was when we put in the dam, we used solar power to run the electric pumps to sprinkle the grass, to grow the grass, to kill the erosion. So that was that was the first one, and it was wildly successful. It was so successful, I said, well, what else can I do with this? And now I overwinter tilapia in a barn, completely heated and maintained by solar power. And next will become the, uh, just like Steve, the next vehicle I get will most likely be an electric pickup truck, mm -hmm. and I want to be able to power it myself. And since it's going to live in that big barn, it's uh, pretty easy to put solar on the roof and charge it from, from the same solar panels. So that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. So, Brian, I know a lot of people say, ooh, I mean, the, you know, the solar power over the course of 10, 20 years will pay off. But sometimes it's somewhat cost prohibitive at the top. You know, you're talking about your farm and talking about all sorts of things that y mm -hmm. you were hoping would be powered by solar. Did you feel that way at first? Yeah, I'm kind of in a u unique position because I, I've uh, saved my pennies, as it were. So I'm able to to have some of these projects and I can be one of those, you know, the leading edge guys that, that pays a little extra up front. Um, I, I have found that solar is a really good thing, but you have to do the math. You have to know how many kilowatt hours of power you're going to use, and you have to know that you can produce X number more than that all the time. Clouds in the wintertime are a big deal, you know, in Southeast Texas, you know, a lot of, a lot of the uh, Gulf moisture comes up. So those times of year, I can't count on it reliably. So I either have to have larger batteries or I have to make sure that that project doesn't need the energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but the big thing is if you over panel everything, if you have enough, which obviously I can afford, um, my projects, I, I typically tend to make them a lot larger, but I also understand there's an awful lot of people who cannot. And so I'm a very pragmatic, very realistic guy. When I talk about solar, I make sure people understand the math right up front. It's how many kilowatt hours, an average house is 30, 35 kilowatt hours a day. And to store that much power. You're, if you use lithium currently, which is pretty much the standard right now, that's $12,000 worth of batteries. Most people can't afford that. And so it, right now, that's not going to happen. So a lot of the grid tied stuff that's happening is great for the bring it into the system. But if you're using the infrastructure as your battery, sooner or later, the rest of us have to pay for the infrastructure. It's kind of like the electric vehicles who aren't paying gas tax. Sooner or later, the rest of us have to pay all the road tax. Mm -hmm. um, so there's going to have to be a change in, on how this works. But it is a really good thing to start moving all of us in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's kind of where I'm, I'm just one of those leading edge guys. 
the the math that you talk about is i think the the first thing that that scares people off but there's so many tools and things and we'll talk about some of those uh what are some of the other considerations beyond the cost beyond figuring out you know how much i need and 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 who's going to install it uh before you even get there what are some of the other things to to take into account steve you did this most recently what are some of the things you had to think about well, this relates a bit to the cost, but it's really important to understand how your uh, local utility company and your state handle the, the charges and the credits you may get for, uh, over gener for surplus generation. And that I know varies quite a bit around the country and even within a, a given state, but it can make all the difference in terms of uh, the payback period for installing solar on your, on your roof and, uh, and, and just the, the month to month cost. Um, so that was, that was one of our big considerations. Another for us was our roof type, which was clay tile. It's probably the most difficult type of roof to get a solar panel system installed. And why? very popular in sunny areas too, right? Yeah. Yes, but, exactly. But Here in it, California. What, what, like, why is it so well, difficult? So um, un unfortunately, clay tiles, um, they themselves form the integrity of water protection. And once you puncture or put a hole in a clay tile, it's, it no longer provides that protection. So for our roof, they basically had to remove all of the clay tiles for the sections of the roof where there would be solar installed, which are major sections, right? Entire uh, sections. Put down a new roof, a uh, asphalt, uh, you know, asphalt tile roof, and then put the panel, install the panels, and then redo the sol the uh, clay tiles, but only for purposes of looks. They don't yeah. serve a purpose well, anymore. That, that was going to be my next question is, you yeah. know, cosmetically, a lot of people would be like, well, no, we don't just yeah. want, you know, some asphalt tiles. So yes, it, you, it, you, you kind of have to think about that. Unless yeah. you don't care, right? And it turned out pretty nicely because solar panels normally are about three, four, five inches from the roof line or the rooftop. But the way they did ours, the clay tiles are basically flush with the panels after they reinstalled the uh, the clay tiles. So it look it looks good. Any other uh, considerations here, Brian? That that you could you could add to this? Well, one of the things Steve just said that caught my attention was the aesthetics brought his panels closer to his his house his roof line and i'm actually standing mine off as far as i can five to six inches because i don't want heat build up underneath my panels because that lowers their efficiency five to ten percent uh, sometimes as high as 15 percent in certain areas um, and with bifacial panels which is something we probably ought to discuss on the different types of panels at some point any reflected light that bounces underneath my panels can also help generate additional power and is that when you you have uh, you have the ability to to use the light that's bouncing underneath, basically? Yes, sir. That, that's yeah, correct. That's essentially what it means. Yeah, that makes sense. My, don't waste that energy. It's right there. Well, not only that, but they last longer because those panels are glass on glass, and they don't have the acidic plastic back sheeting, which over time will break down and destroy your connections. So they last longer. So you get you get more for your money. So Joe, being on a little bit more of the uh, we're making the things that people will use eventually side, uh, what resonates with you here? Well, I, I think uh, Steve brought up a good point is that, you know, th there's a lot of roof considerations that you need to think about. And a lot of it is that, you know, a lot of houses that people are moving into were built 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago when solar wasn't a thing or a consideration. So there's a limited amount of your roof space that's facing south. There might be a lot of gables that separates, you know, the areas where you can put panels. Or maybe you have some large trees in your yard that are shading the roof because, mm -hmm. you know, the old way of thinking about things was to reduce uh, your HVAC costs, which was shading your house. And so houses were just not built for solar panels. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of stuff being installed today where, you know, there's requirements in some states to, to put solar on new houses. And so those design considerations, um, you know, are, are being implemented. But for the most part, it, it's hard to go back and retrofit. So you might be limited in, um, you know, how much solar you can fit on your existing roof. Um, and there are a lot of solar companies out there that will come out there and, and help you do the math. Um, there are different financing structures. So if you don't have, you know, a huge chunk of change uh, to buy the thing up front, you know, maybe you can lease it. Um, so, so the, there are other ways to get into it, but, but, you know, sometimes you're just, uh, out of luck just because of, uh, 
uh, you know, as an earlier out. adopter, <laughs> you kind of have only so many options. Yeah. Yeah. Or there's a huge building next to you that just keeps the sun yeah, off exactly. you all day. Right. I right, mean, like, right like, yeah. You could, you could be in that situation. There's a lot of stuff that's out of your control and, and some utilities have offered, you know, options where, you know, you can, you can select on your bill or, or within your account that you only want to purchase green energy that comes from, you know, larger solar farms that are, you know, connected to the same grid too. So, so there are other options, you know, depending on what region uh, you're in. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that. Cause the, one of the biggest objections I hear from people is, uh, you know, I, I live in Michigan. There's no way I'm ever going to get solar. Does, 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 is that reasonable? Is it, is, is, are there places where you just, it doesn't make sense or is it just mean it's going to be more expensive? It just means it's going to be more expensive and, and, and states can do a lot to mitigate that too. So, you know, one of the states with the highest uh, renewable penetrations for a long time is Massachusetts, you know, not exactly known as a, a sunny state. So there, there are ways to do it. You know, my company is installing uh, solar farms in Michigan. So it does work. Um, you know, prices have come down far enough where, you know, it, it, it can work anywhere. But, you know, the payback might be a little bit longer depending on the incentives and things like that as you're in colder, less sunny climates. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's one of the things I try to get across to people is that, yes, my uh, recovering of investment in California is going to be much faster. That there, there's there's no debating that because we got a lot of sun here, and not a lot of clouds, and, and, and unfortunately for for our water situation, not a lot of rain either. But uh, but it's good for the solar. How do you figure out the budget? Where where do you start to figure out if you can even afford this? And I, I'll throw that open to anybody uh, who wants to answer it. Where did you start, Steve? Yes. <laughs> Come well, on, okay. Steve. <laughs> um, so the fir uh, Brian kind of referred to this, that uh, first you should, uh, the, the first thing to do is determine what you use on an average basis for, from, for electricity um, and maybe on a monthly basis, what's your average use. And it will vary with season depending on your heating and cooling system. But get a profile of that over the year. That's the, that's the starting step. And if you work with a solar company to size your system, they will probably ask, if they're good, they will ask for that. And then the next thing is to start determining, you know, how large your your solar uh, system should be. And again, the, uh, your solar panel provider should um, should help you with that. Um, we there are several online tools that you can use to help assess what is your roof's exposure, and even sometimes considering what the uh, seasonal variations are. Um, so basically you try to match your, uh, supply with what the solar can generate with your demand, or maybe overshoot a bit as Brian recommended. Um, and, uh, that will allow your solar company to determine how many panels to install, what type of system to install. Yeah. And even before you get a solar panel company, like you say, you can use those, those calculators to try to get a ballpark estimate. Uh, yeah. Brian did, is that kind of similar to what you do? Yeah, it's it pretty similar. Um, I did it kind of backwards. I uh, I started going with solar projects and then went, huh, how much do I really need? <laughs> and uh, that's when I started looking at uh, the law. And in Texas, um, certain places have net metering. Certain places only have partial net metering, which is the wholesale non-transmission rate for electricity. So in the part of East Texas where our farm is, that's what I'll be paid, quote unquote, if I sell back power. So what they really want you to do is take care of your own needs. Mm. Um, I decided that more and more things are just going to go electric. And therefore, how much did I need? How much more did I think I need? And then double it. And now all of a sudden, you know, thank you, Elon Musk and, and the rest, you know, electric cars, and electric trucks are becoming very popular. And I'm going to have one at some point, and I want to be able to charge that. Well, a 135 kilowatt hour battery is a lot of electricity. How do I how do I do that? Well, if you look at that building right there, that's the barn. And if I can solar that whole barn, I can charge that truck once a day. Mm -hmm. um, that that dam you see off to to my right, which would be over on the edge, I can put solar on that, and that's the power I tend to, I'm going to plan to sell back. To the grid and that'll be the quote unquote recovery process but it'll be a 15 to 20 year recovery process yeah on the monies but you know thankfully i'm one of those guys that it won't matter nearly as much but i'll be giving back to society as well which mm -hmm. is kind of neat it's kind of fun and i can be one of those people that 
starts the, the conversation and say, I did it on a pretty big scale. No, you, that's not what you're going to do. You're going to be like Steve, you know, figure out what he's doing at his house and, and move on. But we can have the conversation now. And that that's a really good thing is to be able to have these conversations. Yeah. And I, I think that's what sh- shocked me when I did my own solar install was uh, we, I, I had saved up money for it. I, I didn't want to do the lease option, but there are lease options and they, they can work. Uh, but I'd saved up money and I've, I basically said mm. just how, how much do I need? And, and we did exactly what y'all are talking about, which is, you know, we figured out what my, my average power use was. We, you know, padded it up a little bit and then said, this is the, this is the amount of, uh, panels that you need with the amount of sunshine we normally get here. And I got a company that would guarantee that they said, if you fall below that, in fact, I think they, they gave me 110%, like you're going to make 110% of that. And if you fall below 110%, uh, we'll come out and we'll either add a panel or we'll, we'll fix something, but they'll, they'll guarantee it. So, so look for that. If, if you can find a company that will do that for your install. Uh, I, I think that that made me feel a lot better about it. Are they still in business? They are. Yeah. Because that's, that's one of the, the big they do problems the math right well. now. <laughs> yeah. You know, promises are fine until the company goes out of business. Well, yeah. And that, that is the other side is you gotta, you gotta find somebody that you feel is going to stay in business. I mean, Joe, I don't know if you have any uh, insight on, on what to look for there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the larger companies are probably ones you want to go with. There are more, you know, national companies that you can, you know, I, I always recommend people to, to call three of them and have them each come out, give you a quote, play them off of each other uh, and then select one of them. But, you know, I think there's a lot of like two guys in a truck solar out there and you, you got to kind of look out for those guys because it's going to be very, very hard, almost impossible for a, an average homeowner to make a warranty claim against any of the equipment that they install mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you're going to have to try and prove that the equipment is not working as intended, you know, and they could always make the argument like, oh, the panels are dirty or, you know, it's not wired correctly, things like that. So it would just be a huge headache that you'd rather have the installer deal with. So, you know, when I was working on the residential level, if anybody had, uh, if, if their system was dipping below what we projected and what we guaranteed, you know, we would swap out what we thought was the defective part. And then the warranty issues were, you know, part of our obligation at this point. And the homeowner was, you know, back up and running right away. And and that's kind of what you want to look for. Did, did, do you feel like that happened rarely often uh, based on what consumer, you know, expected versus, you, you know, actual reality? It was rare. It, it really was. But, but I mean, you're spending a lot of money on this thing. So you, you don't want to be, you know, left out uh, if it does happen. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so Steve, how did, how did you decide given all this, like got to find somebody who's going to stay in business, gives me a, gives me a decent guarantee. I know we'll do the work properly. You had a whole roof thing to deal with. How'd you decide that? Well, I went to my buddy, Tom Merritt and asked how he got his installed. (laughs) Uh, but the best piece of advice that you gave us was start at energysage.com. I'm not sure if this is countrywide, but it's a great website because, uh, you basically put in your your home and solar information, the basic information of what you're looking for, and they go out and get bids from various companies. Uh, I think it's typically five or six. And then those bids come back to you and then you can choose to pursue those or not. And, and that's how I started. And uh, of course, I did a lot of uh, further investigation on each of those companies, including how long have they been in business? Mm-hmm. Do they have a better business bureau rating? you know, Yelp ratings, the whole nine yards for about three of those companies. And and that's how we ended up going with uh, the company we selected. And a lot of these national companies and the ones that are rated really well, they're going to more or less design the same system. So if you get three companies out there, they're going to be their designs mm-hmm. and, and their offers are going to be really, really close to each they, other. They so, were in our case. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, it's, they're all using like tier one modules and, you know, uh, tier one inverters and things like that stuff that is not, you know, it, it's name brand recognition and companies that will also be around for, for 20 or 30 years. Right. Well. I, I noticed all of the panel manufacturers, the inverters uh, were all very similar brands. There were only like two or three brands of those uh, electronics. Yeah. How, how do you research the type of panels? Uh, do you, is it safe to just tell the general 
populace who's not that interested to go with what the installer recommends or, or should people look into it and, and shop around? I think you can go with what they recommend. I mean, it's it's like I said, there's not a huge difference uh, between the, the, the tier one module manufacturers. They, they get all of their module components from the same factories. They're just uh, putting it together in a different assembly line and then mm. slapping a different sticker on it at the end of the day. So e even, you know, the, we deal with three or four different module manufacturers at our, our company, and there's a minor difference between them. Really, the way that we choose is you know, which ones are available and what can we get a better deal on at the time? Brian, what are your thoughts on this? Did you do some shopping around price comparisons? Oh, I've done so much price comparison around <laughs> the world. It's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> there are several com companies in the United States that will sell you bulk panels, um, pretty much wholesale. And uh, since I'm a do it yourself or kind of guy, I've looked around, I found several companies that have really good prices on the good name stuff, the tier ones, tier twos. Um, and you find that if you look at what the actual output production is, and then I also like the ones that are put together here in the States. Why? Because they just tend to be a little bit cleaner. They tend to have a little less of the imperfections. Uh, and those panels have been producing. I've got some panels that have been running for 12 years right now, and I've been very unkind to those panels. Um, and they're still within just a couple of percent of where they were to begin with. So, you know, if, if you're looking for a turnkey, absolutely tier one is the right way to go. If you're a do it yourselfer, you can look around. There's, there's a couple of mm -hmm. pretty good places to find panels very reasonably and install them yourself. And how, how much uh, time and effort if somebody's like, you know what, I think I want to do that. I, I'm a DIYer. How, how yeah, much, yeah. How like, much what are we, budget? what are we talking? Uh, wow. Um, if you're going to put together a system like Steve's, you're probably going to have to do your research um, for the panels, the racking system, the charge controller, batteries if you're going to use them, and then the inverters. If you're going to go grid tied only, well, then you're probably going to use like the end phase panel mount inverters. And right now the, the quad panel mount seems to be the easy way to go. And then you're going to be quote unquote done. And then you just have to put all that stuff together. Now, some people don't like climbing on their roofs. Some people don't have access to a lift. Out in the country, lifts are pretty easy to find. They're called tractors. Um, so getting up on the roof is really pretty easy. Um, so for me, it was easy. Um, I can weld. I had to do a little bit of custom racking for what some of the things I wanted to do. So I just decided I'd build the rack myself. It's, it's my solar tracker. And... Uh, I get about 28 to 30% more power on the tracker than if I just flat mounted those panels. So those are the panels that I use to run my, uh, what I call tilapotopia, which is keeping the tilapia alive over winter. And uh, it's, it, it, if you have to do all that yourself, you could probably find panels, find all the parts, uh, put it all together and get it on your roof in less than six months, part-time, you know, on your off time, as it were. Mm -hmm. But you have um, to want to. You but you have, have to, to want it. to. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. if you want to, you can save a lot of money and you can put the project, you know, these guys come out and said, well, here's what we're going to do for you. Well, I actually built the barn and I actually built the barn and placed the barn such that I could put solar on that roof before I ever built the barn. So mm -hmm. that was part of the plan for that building. Mm -hmm. Um but a lot of people don't have that. But if you're going to, if you're going to start building a project, if you're going to start building your house, a good Southern exposure gives you the ability to put panels up. Now, 17 foot rails are the normal rails for the long rails. If you want to be off your roof and again, bifacial glass on glass panels right now are probably the gold standard. I'm curious what the other two guys think about panels. Um, but that's, that's where I'm leaning towards. I'm, I haven't bought any panels lately that were not bifacials. And uh, they're going to last longer. I'm going to get better production out of them. And therefore, I want to mount them high. So I, I need those rails. Uh, I could mount them straight on the, the roof of the barn, but then they'd be hotter, mm -hmm. losing percentages because of heat. And they wouldn't get the reflective light underneath them as well. So there's a little bit of trade-off there. And But the nice thing is I'm saving an awful lot of money compared and I can show people how to do it fairly easily. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if so, that helps or not. So find a Brian. No, I find a Brian. <laughs> <laughs> and and just to be clear, when we talk about Southern Light, it's because we're all in the Northern Hemisphere, right? That I mean, correct. it's all going to be different if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. All right. Australians you, are used to having yeah, to. If you happen to be listening to this yeah. and you think like Southern Light, hmm, that's actually like not the light I like the most. You know, it's it. Exactly. It all depends on where you live. Yeah, yeah. Right. Which which part of the equator you're on? Which side of the equator you're on? Any any other thoughts on panels from from Joe or Steve? I just went with what they recommended, and um, one thing to keep in mind that and it. They don't advertise this, and I think they should. The panels are rated as a certain uh, wattage, typically. Ours are, I think, 370-watt panels made by Panasonic. They're not the bifacial that Brian's been talking about. But that is not the power. The That's a peak power, the amount, mm -hmm. the max amount they'll produce. That is not the power that you get at your electrical panel. That's, the I think, the DC power with about an 80% uh, efficiency or 20% conversion loss. So you'll see only 80% of that at its best. Mm -hmm. So um, they will typically take that into account when they size, you know, if you're doing, having a, a company do it for you, unlike Brian, they will size your system and take that into account. But if you're trying to do back of the envelope calculations to kind of confirm what they're mm -hmm. doing, which is what I did, uh, I was off by a little bit. And, and it's because of that 20% loss of getting the DC power to AC at your electrical panel. So Joe, you have any, anything else to add? Yeah, um, I would just say that you know over the last you know twenty or thirty years, the, the the biggest innovation in solar panels has been you know putting cells on the back of it. So you know a lot of times I'll hear people say something like you know they're waiting five or ten years for the next big innovation to come around because you know you, you read these things online where scientists at MIT have developed a solar cell that you know slices bread or whatever, you know, it, it does yeah, everything. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, and they're like, oh, I'll wait for that to come out. But, but, you know, we're seeing a lot more solar now just because the installation and the manuf manufacturing costs have gone way, way down. So the panels are really aren't that much different than they have been. It's just that they've gotten so much more uh, cost competitive. Yeah. No, not even more efficient. It's, it's the panels are getting bigger. So the, the efficiency's only gone up a few percent, but hmm. it's just so much cheaper to manufacture them and it's so much cheaper to install them than it used to be that prices have gone down 50 to 80%. And that's why we're seeing more. So it's hmm. this idea that like, hey, I'll wait for the next great thing to come out is, you know, you might be waiting a long time. Whereas, you know, that great new thing not only has to prove to be effective in the real world, but then it also has to be commercially competitive with, with stuff that's been on the market for 20 years. And that's going to be really tough. You know, th these things are going to pay back in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, depending on where you live. So you can kind of do that math. So it's still a good investment now. And then, you know, once it's paid itself back, if you want to look in and, and uh, retrofit with the latest and greatest at the time, then, then you can look into doing that. But I, I wouldn't delay for, for a, a technological innovation. You know, this is a little bit of a, you know, a, 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 um, a personal question because I don't own a home. I don't, um, you know, I, I'm a renter. Is there anything in the solar area? Um, and I guess this question is for you, Joe, and, and maybe you, Brian, or, or, or Steve as well. Anything that I can do um, without having to make some big investment that's going to be like 5, 10, 20 years going down the road that can help me and help the environment potentially? Yeah, I mean, if, if your utility gives you the option to buy clean energy, that's that's the easiest way to do it. You're just checking a box on a form. Um, or if or if you can find a company or, you know, convince your landlord to find a company to, to lease the panels, that's no money down. So you don't have to worry about payback. You know, you're probably only going to be saving 10 or 15 bucks a month on your electric bill, you know, yeah, which, which yeah. isn't huge. But I'll yeah, take it, it. It's, yeah, yeah, it's not nothing, but it, it's yeah. no money down up front as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, but but it is tough when, you know, the person who's actually cutting the check, you know, maybe the homeowner is different from the person who's benefiting it, who's the mm. person who's paying the power bill. So that, right, that's, right. that's another big hurdle that, that we see in places where, where people rent. Well, folks, if you're enjoying this conversation uh, and you're not a patron, go find one of our patrons and thank them because that's why we're able to do this show. Uh, and we thank everybody who supports us at patreon.com slash DTNS. Uh, and in fact, we like to reward them for sticking around and keeping the show going. That's why we're happy to offer Patreon loyalty rewards. Uh, so if you stick with us for three months, 
uh, depending on what level you're supporting us at, you can get, uh, we'll send you a sticker or a mug or a t-shirt, even got hoodies in there and little tote bags uh, mm -hmm. every three months. As Love long a tote. Yeah. Sarah's got one of the totes. Uh, <laughs> just stay a patron at a certain level and you can get all the details at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's, uh, let's talk about this from the perspective of the utilities, which, which I know Joe has a, a good understanding of. Uh, what should homeowners understand and what do utilities need to do to prepare a homeowner to understand uh, if they're moving to solar? Um, well, I, I would just say that I think that utilities are, are generally against it because uh, you're, you're buying less of their product. Mm -hmm. So uh, they've kind of been dragged kicking and screaming into this uh, based on states have what's called an RPS or a renewable power uh, standard. So um, they're, they're generally going to be uh, fighting it a little bit. The, the one thing that they can benefit from, if, if you're in an area that doesn't um, charge you power by the time of day, let's say you have a, a flat rate. Um, so you, you, might be, you might be using power you know, in the evening when it's very expensive for the utility to, to buy it and you're actually buying it at a cheap rate. Um, so, so there are some ways that the utility actually does benefit from, from homeowners installing solar. Um, but but there are grid limitations when you have like your distribution lines. If, if you have a, a large renewable uh, penetration into the grid, then those lines need to be upgraded, and they usually do it at the utility's cost. And uh, to Brian's point earlier, if you're not buying power from the utility, that cost gets spread out amongst other people as well. So um, you know, it's it's I, I was I was a little jaded from the uh, when I was doing residential installs. Um, just because th there's a lot of barriers. The utility has a lot of power um, and uh, in this case, and distributed energy cuts from their bottom line. And so they're not, they're not huge fans of it. You know, I, the utility scale uh, farms that I do now, you know, we sell power to the utility that they then sell to you. So they're okay with that because mm -hmm. they're getting a cut of it yeah. and, and we're upgrading mm -hmm. the grid for them to, to install it. So, you know, that, in my mind, that's where we're going is the grid is going to become clean uh, because of these utility scale plants, um, because the utilities are going to be okay with it. And then battle number two is to try to knock down these monopolies that are the utilities. Mm -hmm. That was going to be my question. Do you ever see a, a world where it is not the utility that has gone green, but a, a, a solar only utility that becomes um, a viable uh you know, option for people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're headed that way. The, the economics are going in that direction. You know, g gas and coal are getting more expensive and solar and wind are getting cheaper. So, um, and batteries are getting cheaper as well. Uh, lithium ion, which is mostly the technology that's being used. It's what you find in your car, your laptop, your phone. You know, those were built for power density. And so you could carry them around and they would be portable. They're, they're not ideal for uh, grid integration. So um, they work and, and, and they're pretty price competitive now, but there will be something around the corner, a, a, a better use case for different chemistries or, or different technologies. So that only has the potential to get better too. So, I mean, there's really no doubt in my mind that by 2050, the grid itself is going to be entirely renewable with energy storage. Um, but, but like I said, the, the second part of that is, is getting the utilities on board to, to, rest power away. Um, some of them have been doing something called like a community energy program where they're doing smaller, smaller utility scale. So maybe one megawatt, two megawatt farms, and then they'll sell that to their, their customers. But in that case, they still have the power. They're still the middleman. So it's going to take a long time before it's, you know, everybody with solar on their rooftops and they're yeah. interconnected and sharing it. And they have like a microgrid going mm -hmm. on. It, it's, that's a ways out. Although, Brian, you, you've got kind of your own personal microgrid going on over there. I do. Uh, a couple of things that I see differently than Joe. Um, out where I'm out in East Texas, the utility actually cares more about safety than, than the cost. They want to make sure that you're 1741 compliant. They want to make sure that uh, you have good grid sensing. Um, they actually, up to 25 kW, uh, continue production. They're happy with you. It, it really just costs $50 for the fee and for the gentleman or the lady to show up, inspect your system, show that you're compliant, and they're happy to have that power. So that I do like. Um, as to where we're gonna go, if you look at all the storage technologies, the sodium batteries, the 
the iron air batteries, salt water batteries, all the things that are coming. I think it's, it's going to be very hard for the average homeowner to have the kind of storage that they have to have built into their residency, especially apartment buildings, especially, mm. you know, large cities where you can't possibly generate the energy you, you use. Um, that's not going to happen. You're still going to have a base load of power that has to be generated someplace. Obviously, fusion is, is less than 30 years away now. Um, and I say that humorously. And, well, yeah, and it will be for, for many years. <laughs> right. It'll be 30 years away, yeah. But but if, if fusion shows up, that fixes a lot of things. Um, there's a lot of other technologies out there, and I, I'm not trying to digress. Uh, solar is great, but if you look at California, there was a couple of years where California actually had to pay Arizona to use their solar power during the day because mm. they generated too much. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that. those balancing acts and, and getting all the systems to work together. Just, just to be clear, if people didn't quite get, catch what Brian said, California was generating so much solar energy, they paid Arizona to use the solar energy that correct. California was generating, correct? correct. Yeah, yeah. Yes, um, so... This Which a, seems very backward, by the way. Like but we got to send happened. it somewhere, and Arizona's like, yep. "I don't know. You give it, pay us, we'll take it." Right. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, and if, and the infrastructure is going to be one of those things: a smart grid with real and artificial intelligence that really watches what's going on, and the homeowners in suburbia having their their local storage. We can get most of the way there. I don't think in my lifetime we get to the everyone's generating everything on renewables. Um, windmills just don't have the energy density. If you look at a, an average wind farm, one gas fired generator puts out more power than the entire wind farm. So the economies of scale just aren't there unless you're going to take North Dakota and turn it into a wind farm. Mm -hmm. And, and then, then you can make enough power for the United States when it blows. <laughs> oh, well, hmm. so, I mean, uh, <laughs> a lot of people be like, can we? Yeah. Right. I was like, I mean, we could probably exempt Fargo and it would, you know, yeah, it's workable. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know. no, it's a point taken. Yeah. 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 So it's it's storage, storage, storage. Um, and I, I was going to go with 20 kW for, for my farm. And I went, no, I'm going to go to 30. And then I doubled it to 60. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and then I went, well, in a couple of years, I'm going to have even more because I'm going to have two vehicles that I have to charge. Yep. And if that's 130 kW a vehicle, guess where I'm going to have to go to? Yeah. So it's, that's and the a, real thing. And, and you, you won't run into this, but, but Steve will, uh, cause I know I will. There's, there's a maximum to, to what you can put up there. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. And at that point you have to figure out how you're going to charge the things you're going to do. Now, some things you can charge at different times and different rates. You know, you can go charge your car at any charging station. Sure. If, yeah. if you can't generate enough, but I don't have a charging station out in the farm other than the one I'm going to put in. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question for you, Steve. I mean, do you think about uh, expansion and what happens next? I mean, yep. obviously you've had pretty good results, but, you know, if, if you want to expand this whole uh, uh, operation. Yes, definitely. Um, we're happy with the solar system as installed. We're getting good performance, follows what was expected. What we're moving into next is energy storage, as Brian's been discussing. <laughs> So we're now in the process of having <clears throat> a couple Tesla power walls installed on our house to, uh, to store that energy. Um, and that, that will be its own adventure, I'm sure, but not as aggressive as Brian. I think uh, we're getting, we'll get about 26 k uh, kilowatt hours of storage out of those two, getting to. 27 maybe out of those two. Uh, I think they're 14 power. out piece. Yeah, good. Oh, they're, they're rising. <laughs> so the main thing is to, I mean, we're, that will not pay off like like the solar panels will. We're doing that for other reasons. I mean, there may be a slight payback to shift our energy use from the the peak time of use rate to the lower costs, so we're we're not drawing power during the expensive times. That's a minor savings. It doesn't really pay off very soon, but it, we will back be backed up for power outages, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, we just want to be able to operate our house when, um, you know, without electricity. Now, I don't know, Brian, are you off the grid or are you still on the grid? I am both. Our cabin, can is, be... our cabin is on grid. That new, the new barn is off grid completely. And the, when we build our quote unquote retirement house, that will be coupled so that I can okay. 
sell back power, but I will definitely be a net producer at that point. Yeah. Patiently so, awaiting my invite. You're always welcome. To, to the ranch. It Come on out. Really Go great. fishing. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you guys are welcome anytime. Oh, thanks. So real quickly, people need to I, understand. Oh, no, um, go ahead. When you install a solar power system on your house, minus without batteries, you cannot power your house from solar power directly. Correct. You you need to have some buffer between the panels and your main electrical panel, and that is the batteries. A lot of people don't quite understand that or assume that you can power your house directly. So you must have batteries if you want to power your own, uh, you know, power down during a, a power outage. But in California, I think we cannot be off the grid. Is that right, Tom? That is correct. Yeah, we, at least, we can't. At least you have LA, to. I, I, let me say, L A W D W P. You can. I think it and, might, might be different. And Southern, Ca yeah. Southern Cal Edison, which I'm part of, I don't think you mm -hmm. can. So, and that covers probably ninety percent of California. Well, and just just for you know clarification, for people who don't know who Edison or you know power company, look, why why can't you? That's a good question. I Wait, think why, can't, why can't your why can't your panels create power during a blackout? No, no why, why, why can't, can't you be off the grid? Why does the utility require us to send all of our solar panel electricity to them? Yeah. Why why can't we separate from the grid? Yeah. In a normal They're monopoly. Uh, it's a it's a policy move that says okay. we want to manage all of your electricity, right? Is that sound right, Joe? Yeah. And, and, and there are safety considerations too, and, and sure. maybe maybe this is kind of off topic, but it, if there is a blackout and they have you know linemen working to bring the grid back up, they don't want solar power injecting power into that grid that they're they're not yeah. aware of too. Sure, uh, they wouldn't be able to. So do so, that. The, so for for a while they weren't letting anybody do a black start or anything. You had to fully disconnect from the grid if you wanted uh, to be generating power. Which I, in I started out in Hawaii and and they were allowing people to do that because it's an island, mm -hmm. um, and and they. It happened quite often, but yeah, I'm. I got a couple other a couple was. other points I, I want to hit before we wrap up here. Uh, one is is tax breaks, rebates, subsidization. How much did that figure into your decision, uh, Steve? Big time. <laughs> so uh, everyone in the U.S. is eligible at least through this year for a twenty six percent incentive investment tax credit if they install solar on their on their house. And I think that applies to battery systems as well. Is that right, Brian? Uh, primary residence, any solar component, the last I checked. Any solar and storage? Yeah, the storage is part of the solar. System. Okay. So that's, that's 20, uh, 26% primary currently. Residence. It was 30% in, I'm talking. Uh, yeah, it was 30% th when I installed mine. I just yeah, that sneaked was in right at the end. 2018 or 2019. Mm -hmm. I think it's been going about going down about two percent a year next year it goes to four percent a year joe maybe it goes four. down to 26 and then 22 okay yeah and then it expires in 2024 i believe it goes Unless, down to 10 percent oh it, it does it's still around 10. yeah okay i thought congress would have to renew uh, so that was a huge that was a huge incentive for us that and um there were other california and utility subsidies and uh other other things that would offset the cost, but we weren't eligible for those. So it was mainly the federal tax tax credit. Can I be the contrarian on this one? Sure. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> when the tax incentives showed up, the prices went up. Oh. So when these incentives go away, the real price of solar installation for everybody should go down. Um, Interesting. Pro probably not the amount of the of the credit, but probably darn close. Yeah, so because you, you've injected you've injected money into the into the system, basically, is, is yes, how that argument goes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I did notice when they were providing quotes, the first number they quoted was with the tax credit included. And I, That's not the way you give me a bid. Give me the total price. I will mm -hmm. take the tax credit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up was was maintenance and monitoring real quick. And 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 for me, uh, as far as what I know is, you know, getting up there and cleaning those with with some clean water. Uh, you know, getting deposits off regularly is is pretty much the only maintenance I have to do. The rest of the maintenance is covered by the installer to say, like, if we notice some, an inverter going out and, and it shouldn't be, we'll we'll roll a truck and all of that. There's uh, a login for Enphase and Lighten that lets me see what the power usage is and, and monitor all that. Uh, anything additional that y'all do that 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 you want to mention, Brian? Is there there anything different that you do for that? Um, I have my drone and I go up and inspect everything. Nice. Um, <laughs> Just, yeah. Gotta well, love Brian. Hey, well, <laughs> hey, 
come on out and <laughs> enjoy the fun. But uh, there are a lot of birds. Um, I've made uh, made a farm with with trees, so I have a lot of birds around. Um, so I got to make sure they're not nesting up there every once in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, Simple Green works really well with a high pressure sprayer to get the the cleaner up on the roof, and I know that's non toxic. Um, so that's what I clean my my stuff with. That and uh, my when ones that are ground mount, I just use a a microfiber cloth, and it does a great job cleaning those up. Um, right. And the cabling, I over cable everything. I make sure everything's UV rated, um, and then I use uh, conduit to to ship everything back and forth, and that's all buried. Um, so very low maintenance. Steve, what about you? Pretty much what you've said, Tom. Um, just some water. I we can't easily get on our roof. But uh, just spraying water up on top and letting it come off uh, seems to be good. There may be a day where we have to get up there and it'll be more of a challenge with our two-story clay tile roof. Yeah. And you want to not use hard water if you can at all avoid yeah, it. Yeah. You know, right. But, uh, Joe, any other thoughts that you, you have, of the, any tips you could throw out there, anything like that? No, I mean, just, just monitoring it, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, and, and getting up there and washing it, um, especially you know, in the spring or in the fall, um, mm -hmm. so you can capture the best times of year. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank y'all for, for doing this. This has been uh, really fun. I've, I've mm. learned things, uh, along the way. I'm sure the audience has as well. Uh, we'll, we'll go around the horn for, for any last thoughts, any, any regrets, any advice you'd have, uh, for, for people, uh, about solar. Uh, we'll start with you, Brian. I have no regrets. Uh, I love playing with solar. Uh, I, I enjoy all the projects. Uh, I've got more projects than I can get finished. Uh, solar is going to be one of those really nice things that we can do for our own planet. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to continue doing it. Um, in fact, I'm going to design the house with the appropriate facings so I can add more solar to the house if I felt like it. Um, I think home storage is going to be a big deal, especially with brownouts, blackouts, uh, grid problems. Those can, uh, can do that. Uh, Mm -hmm. more better and same with the uh, the new vehicles that are doing two-way charging mm -hmm. i think that's going to really take a little bit of the load off of the grid and i, and I think that's something that's that's going to help long term steve what about you any 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 last thoughts things you'd do differently advice for others um one word of advice if you're going with a contractor it like most major projects it will probably take longer than they quote so bear <laughs> and that be in more mind. expensive and then possibly our company was pretty good about. Yeah, we came in costs. on we came in on the expense, just exactly what they said. But yeah. Yeah, that's good. But yeah. the time was, and part of that is there are things out of their control, like uh, permits from the city and and the utility. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, j just put a little buffer on if you have a time element here that you need to worry about. But I have no regrets except I wish I had done it earlier, back back when the uh, when the rate was uh, the tax credit was thirty percent. Although from what Brian said, maybe that wouldn't have made much of a difference. Panels were, were more expensive then. Yeah, yeah. but I do yeah. feel better having solar uh, offset our uh, larger electrical demands in our house. Joe, any thoughts to add to that? Yeah, I would say if you're curious about it, you know, um, you can do some research and find some large reputable country, uh, companies in your area and, and have them come out. Usually they'll come out and give you uh, uh, an inspection, uh, an analysis and, and a free quote. So no charge to you. They can give you a good idea of what your potential is, what the cost might be, maybe different financing structures. Um, so it, it's a good way to do some research that isn't you know, that intimidating. Well, we sure love to have having all of you, Joe, Steve, and Brian, um, as our solar panel on the show. <laughs> ha ha. Our get solar it? panel. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It's just, you know, got the jokes. Uh, just a reminder <laughs> that the, the regular DTNS show is live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. But boy, this was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you gentlemen for bringing the information and bringing the education to all of us. I hope all of you out there in the Patreon world learned a little something as well. And, uh, and we hope you have a, all a nice weekend. Steve, if, if people want to find you, uh, where should they go? You can find me at SP Sheridan on Twitter. And I also contribute to my wife, Allison's website, which is podfeet, P O D. F E E T dot com. Brian, uh, if, if folks want to follow you, is there a place they can go? And <laughs> not till I retire. <laughs> I got too many projects. <clears throat> but folding at home, good day, internet team. 
Got to plug that. Still top five, so I'm pretty happy with that. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Thanks for supporting that 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 effort as well. I know you you said you've got a whole machine devoted to it. That's mm-hmm. great. Yep. Uh, and Joe, thank you as well. Uh, I I don't know if there's anything you want to tell folks or or not, but it, it was great to have you. No, well, yeah, thank you uh, for having me. And and if people do have questions, they can find me on Twitter at j a briney b r i n e y. Um, I usually don't post a lot, but if you have questions and you want to message me, I'll I'll be happy to answer them. All right. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, If you can't afford solar yet, at least go enjoy some sunshine. We'll talk to you soon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) That was great.